this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this sixth episode of Lawyer on Air. I'm Catherine O'Connell. Today, I'm joined by Mindy Allen, who is counsel at Southgate, a boutique M&A law firm in Tokyo. I'm not quite sure if Mindy herself is aware, but I have been wanting to chat with Mindy for a long while. Mindy's Japanese connection and crossover into law reminds me of my path. Her love for Japanese language came first. Same here. Then, through an experience exposed to law as a legal intern in a firm, she found law to be her next passion. For me, it was a different experience, but still there was a trigger to follow the law. We both also have a connection to Osaka. Mindy worked in a law firm there. Me is in-house counsel some years earlier. Now she's at a boutique law firm in Tokyo and I run a boutique law firm myself. And so I have been curiously on the sidelines observing Mindy's career. But let me go back a little bit and brief you on Mindy's path and then we will head into our conversation and go a bit deeper. So Mindy's study and career look to me like a perfect Venn diagram. Imagine, if you will, one big circle on the left, which is what I call Japanese language in Asia, and the big circle on the right is law. In the middle is the crossover of the two, which is where she is now in Tokyo, leveraging both those parts and excelling as a bilingual M&A lawyer. Mindy is from New York and her academic background crosses four educational institutions. She graduated with a JD from Stanford University in 2010 and three years before that with a BA in East Asian Languages and Cultures, then an MA in East Asian Regional Studies, both from Columbia University in the city of New York. Mindy also had a year at Kyoto Center for Japanese Studies from 2004 to 5 and Keio University in Tokyo from 2007 to 8. Mindy's career path in the law also traverses several different terrains. Early days saw her interning at a Japanese bank and at US firms, then jumping to a Japanese law firm and another couple of US firms. She did a stint on secondment at a trading company in Japan, and then she landed at Southgate and has been there for two and a half years and recently promoted to counsel. To me, law career is not a linear thing. It's more like a spiral or a winding road of curves and valleys and sharp turns and long stretches. And Mindy has really got a varied career and is a super example to anyone listening that you can do a lot with your legal career and go many places and experience different sides of the law. So I'm super excited to have captured Mindy as my guest today. Mindy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. That was such a nice introduction. And I've also actually been watching you and wanting to talk to you. So what a great opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, that's great. The feeling is very much mutual. And so today we are going to be talking about your amazing career, how you've navigated your studies, your adventures all around the Olympic track of law. (laughs) your insights into the future of law and I'd really love you to also offer some nuggets of advice for your young lawyers all those young lawyers out there on their career path here so how does that sound that sounds great let's get started awesome so today again we're talking online because the state of emergency in Tokyo has been extended for another month or so but if we were meeting up in person where would we be do you have a favorite wine bar or a restaurant you love to go to and what is your choice of beverage off the menu today I wish I had a favorite wine bar, but I really don't know much about wine or appreciate it enough. So if you would indulge me, I guess I would want to go to my favorite neighborhood restaurant. I live in Edisu and it's called Teitote and they have great pizza and outdoor seating and pre-pandemic times it's open until five in the morning and their food is just great and it's really friendly. And my favorite part as a dog owner is that dogs are allowed inside. So I usually bring my dog when I go. 
That is fantastic. So you did you often stay there till five in the morning? Is that what I'm hearing? No, I have never gone. That late. <laughs> never. I don't think I've been there past like 11 or so, but it's a nice option if we if we were deep in conversation and didn't want to have to worry about closing times. Sure. And I love that a lot of restaurants now in Tokyo do allow doggies to come along. Yeah. <laughs> It really makes the atmosphere quite different, I think, when you've got dogs. Yeah, it's really relaxed. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. But a lot of places allow them on the terrace, but it's rare. It's still a bit rare to find places where they're allowed inside the restaurant as well, especially in winter when you can't eat outside. It's a nice option. Well, thank you for that. And I really would love to come and meet with you in Ebisu sometime and, and go to dinner there. That would be really great. That would be great. Thanks so much. And so I'm trying to think back to when we officially, and I mean officially met, do you remember, I think it was Women in Law Japan, maybe last year in January. And then in last year during the year, we one of my clients needed some specialist help. And I remember going to the office and seeing you at your office there. Is that the first couple of meetings that we had? I think that's right. That's my recollection that you came to my office in 2019 with your client. And I know that before that, maybe a year or two before you gave that talk at Amazon about starting your own legal practice. And I was working at Trading House at the time and I really wanted to go. I was really interested in the various career paths people had taken in Tokyo, but I didn't make it. And that was when I first heard your name and heard about your career. And I was really sad that I missed it. So I was really excited when you came to our office for a meeting that time to get to meet you in person for the first time. Right. That was 2018. I just launched. I think I was only a few minutes in and our first podcast guest Angela Krantz was moderating that event that was when it was and you couldn't get there mm -hmm. wow okay so you've taken quite a few different paths since then and and before that I wish you'd been there we could have met yeah yeah I'm so glad that serendipity has brought us together so mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question here Maybe you're not prepared for this one. Maybe you are. But I really want to know when you were back being a child, what it was that you wanted to be. You're a lawyer now, but when you were a child, what did you want to be? Hmm, I wanted to be a lot of different things. For a phase, I, I used to, when I was maybe in like, elementary school or middle school. I really loved John Grisham books. He's a legal writer in the US. For a while, I did want to be a lawyer but I wanted to be like a courtroom advocate, which is really strange to me because that's actually one reason why I didn't end up being a litigator because as I got older, the idea of public advocacy really terrified me. <laughs> so for a while, I wanted to do that. For a while, I wanted to be an interior decorator. Mm. And then for a long time, I wanted to be a therapist before college. And I think I, maybe that was what I wanted to do the longest. How interesting, but I think in a way, lawyering is a little bit like giving people therapy. Yeah, it is kind of like giving advice to your client. And I'm sure therapists also have the experience that sometimes your client doesn't want the advice <laughs> or they don't take the advice or they fight you, which is difficult. But ultimately, you're trying to help your client kind of navigate a difficult situation and figure out how to do things better. It's true. But even as a therapist too, right, the client or the customer may not want that therapy, but they do end up accepting. Yeah, they need it. That's why you're, you're in that relationship in the first place. Mm. Interesting. And so let's traverse that Japan and Japanese language journey first. I've heard that your first experience with Japanese actually arose because of your dad's influence. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, my dad had a really big influence on how I first got started studying Japanese and coming to Japan many years ago. My dad is a chef and as part of his training, he worked in Paris and he studied in Israel. He studied Hebrew and Arabic. And so he, and he picked up some French when he was studying cooking at the Sorbonne. So he was always very interested in other languages and cultures. And when I was growing up, he always said like, you cannot just speak English. You have to study other languages. Like you have have to study other cultures. You have to get as much international experience as you can. So he he always instilled that in me. And I studied Spanish and French in school growing up because of him. And then when I was in high school, I grew up in a suburb of New York that has a pretty large Japanese expat population because it's close to Manhattan. So I always grew up going to Japanese restaurants and Japanese supermarkets. And when I was in high school, my dad had an idea for us to start studying Japanese together. Once a week, there was a small Japanese school not too far away. So that was, it was totally random. A lot of times people start studying Japanese in America because they like anime or something like that. But for me, it was just an idea that my dad had had and I, I always like studying foreign languages so it's like 
okay, <laughs> that would be a nice activity to do together. So that was how I got started. Good, great. Did your dad also cook Japanese food? No, he, he doesn't cook Japanese food. And actually being a chef is really demanding. So he would, he worked six days a week when I was growing up and he rarely cooked at home because he was so busy working. He had to work every night and weekend basically on parties and dinners. So he didn't do that much cooking, but he loves Japanese food and a for much of when I was growing up, every Sunday night, we would go to a Japanese restaurant called Sudu, about 20 minutes from my house. So I, I always had some exposure to Japan from a young age. Wow. And your dad's been to Japan? He has. I studied abroad in college for a year and my parents came to visit me then. And that was a great trip. And then a few years ago, he came back and originally he was going to come with some family for the Olympics. <laughs> But obviously that didn't happen, but he absolutely loves Japan. He loves Japanese food. It's one of his favorite cuisines. So I know he'll be back in the future when international travel resumes. Oh, great. And I have to ask you, when you're studying Japanese together, were you competitive? How did you study together? <laughs> no, my dad dropped out very early. <laughs> <laughs> so I really didn't need to compete very hard. <laughs> You won. Okay, that yeah, was easy. <laughs> my, my dad just stopped going and I continued myself, but I give him a lot of credit and he can still to this day more or less read hiragana and katakana. So, and he still tries to practice Japanese sometimes. And every year when it's my birthday and he sends me a message, he says, Tanjo bi omedito, Mindy san. <laughs> that is so sweet. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. And so he says, Happy birthday to you in Japanese. Mm -hmm. That's so sweet. <laughs> You should record him when he does that this year. You <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you haven't already had your birthday this year. <laughs> so when did you first come to Japan then? Had you already studied Japanese before you came here? I did. I had studied just a little bit. I was doing an hour less than a week, which for such a difficult language is not really enough to make much progress. But because of that, I had some interest in Japan. And before I went to college, I had done a few different like study, study programs over the summers before college. And I found out about a program to come to Japan and live with a homestay family and study Japanese. So I thought that sounded exciting. And my dad really encouraged me to do it. So that was what I did. Was that in Tokyo, outside of Tokyo, that program? It was outside of Tokyo and Tokushima. It was an organized program, so I wasn't alone, but it was my first time in Asia. I'd never been so far from home before. And it was a really big culture shock to come to Japan. And also uh, I lived with a family in a really rural area and I like walked through a rice paddy to get to the bus to go to my school every day. And I grew up in a very, very developed urban area. So it was quite shocking to kind of, I'd never really seen rural life anywhere before. So it was a big change to get used to that kind of lifestyle as well. Wow. Completely different from, you know, downtown Manhattan to yeah. paddy fields of Japan. And so is there a memory from your homestay, something that you saw? surprised you about Japan back then and maybe something that was really obvious then now which is now no longer around in Japan one of, <laughs> one of my most I don't know if this is a good answer to your question but one of my most vivid mem memories which was a bit of a shock for me was that I think we had a retreat to go like stay in a temple overnight somewhere and I packed a bag of clothes to take and my host mom came in and kind of went through my bag and I, <laughs> she, <laughs> she saw I had obviously packed underwear and she like I guess she didn't think it was hidden and demure enough and she like gave me a silk case to put it in and she said like boys got pants in me master <laughs> like the boys will see your underwear <laughs> <laughs> she gave she like put it in a special case so it wouldn't be visible under any circumstances even if I emptied my bag onto the floor and I thought that was so interesting and so funny like even just living together for a few weeks that she just had this really strong sentiment like as a woman you must be demure you cannot you know show anything private like that right interesting I don't know why 
modesty, right? Yeah, exactly. Modesty. I remember homestays coming to stay with our family in New Zealand and we'd have washing day and the girls would always get their washing back into their room and hang it up. They brought the hanger with them and had it hanging up in their bedroom. They didn't want it out on the line. Yeah, interesting. I guess it was the same reason that nobody can see, especially your private items. Yeah, that's interesting. That was very shocking. And I, another, it wasn't a huge cultural shock, but just factual. One of my, when my host family picked me up at the place where all the students went their various directions and drove to our house, they said my host dad was a chef. He ran his own restaurant. So I thought that's so cool because my dad is a chef. I wonder if that's why I got placed with them. And they said he runs a Japanese pizza restaurant. And it was right next to their house. And I was like, oh, that sounds great. I like pizza. And it turned out what they meant was okonomiyaki. They were calling it Japanese pizza. So the first time I had it, I was a little disappointed, I admit, because it's really nothing like pizza. No, it's not. But it seems to be the okonomiyaki is the way that it's described, isn't it, for foreigners to understand. Yeah. But if you're looking for a base and then everything on top, that's not what it is. But we won't, <laughs> tell, we won't tell anyone who hasn't perhaps tried it and they can try that again at a restaurant in the future. That's so interesting. So you got your your taste, literally, yeah, for Japan. I think that's 2001. And and so then you studied at Columbia University in New York and the additional study in Kyoto, you did two degrees at Columbia. Mm -hmm. So your dad influenced you on your study choices there. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I knew having gone to Japan and having started studying Japanese just a little bit before college that I wanted to keep studying. I'd always enjoyed studying foreign languages and where I went, Columbia had a really good East Asian studies program. So when I started at school, I knew I wanted to study Japanese and I wasn't sure if I would pursue that as a major or pursue something else. But I started taking classes and East Asian studies, like Japanese politics classes, and I really liked it. So basically, the more I studied, the more I wanted to keep studying in that area. And then I decided I wanted to spend, in America, it's not uncommon to spend your junior year of college studying abroad if you have interest in another country. I knew I wanted to do that. So once I decided to major in that area, I realized like all of my courses would count toward my major. So it would be possible to do that. And it would be possible to spend a whole year there and have all my courses count. Right. So they had a program, an exchange program with Kyoto, did they? Was that you found that you found that yourself, that program? I didn't find it myself, but it wasn't quite an exchange. It was called Kyoto Center for Japanese Studies. And it was a consortium of something like 10 or 13 U.S. universities that all get together. And they have like an affiliated Japanese university. I think at the time it was Kyoto University and they had some programs with like Ritsumeikon and we would have some exchange events with local Kyoto students, but it was like a standalone center. But I think maybe now it's part of Ritsumeikon for a while it was maybe part of Kyoto University. Right. And so you did that. I mean, many people would have just stayed and did their study or not gone as far away from home to come to Japan again, but you did that. And so what did you love about living in Japan at that time, that second trip around here? That was much easier because I I lived by myself. So I guess I didn't have to worry. I mean, in some ways I regret not living with a host family and getting that experience, but it was very challenging when I'd been in Tokushima to communicate with my family because they didn't speak a word of English and I just knew a couple of Japanese phrases. So I really wanted to kind of form a deep connection with them, but the language barrier made it really tough. Mm. So it was easier not dealing with that in Kyoto, but also I I just love so many things about it. I loved like living independently and kind of cooking for myself and figuring out what I was going to like see and do on the weekends. And I loved the program made really great use of the city. We had a lot of field trips. We went to like a sake brewery. Mm. We went to a lot of temples. We saw, I guess, a whiskey brewery. We saw various factories. You must have been over 20 at that time to be drinking. Yeah, I was. I think I was exactly 20. (laughs) Perfect, perfect, perfect. (laughs) So what happened after Kyoto? Did you, you came back to Japan or did you find some work in Tokyo or around in Japan at that time? I got really lucky then. I can't remember exactly when I decided to go to law school, but I think I had basically decided by then. And I got really lucky 
and through kind of randomly, my, my mom was a speech pathologist and she would go to people's houses and do therapy with kids. And she mentioned to one of the families that her daughter was studying abroad in Kyoto. And that person said, oh, my brother-in-law is a lawyer in Tokyo. And my mom was like, oh, interesting. My, my daughter wants to go to law school. So I was really lucky. And when my parents came to visit me in Kyoto and we went to Tokyo together while I was studying abroad, I was very, very lucky to meet this person in person. And he was an, an American lawyer who'd been living in Japan for many years. He worked at a large international law firm. He was very nice and gave me a summer internship opportunity at that law firm. So that was my first legal experience, legal work experience. And so I ended up right after my program in Kyoto, I ended up going back to Japan for the summer to do an internship in Tokyo at a law firm while I was still in college. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. It was a great experience for me. It was one of my first times working in a professional environment, even getting paid. I had done a lot of it unpaid internships in New York, but it was nice to kind of have a job that I went to every day and got paid for. And that particular firm had Japanese, American, British, Australian attorneys all together. A lot of people spoke at least two languages. The work was very international. And even though I, I wasn't doing much of the legal work because I was still in college, I just found the environment really exciting and interesting. And that was when the seed was kind of planted. Like, I want to come back to Japan after going to law school and do this. Extremely international. Some people may have a view that Japan must be just Japanese law firms and Japanese lawyers, but you got a peek through the door there to see an international environment. But even just seeing that and seeing that cultural and language mix, it still takes a mental jump from being an intern to considering law seriously. So what was working there for you that made you really, really solidify on I'm going to do law? Is there something that triggered you there? I mean, I think my parents were definitely encouraging me to go to law school at that time. I think I kind of grew up in a strict, not a strict household per se, but my parents really encouraged me to kind of go into one of the traditional professions being medicine or law. And so for a while, when I had wanted to be a therapist when I was younger, my parents, my dad in particular was like, well, you can't just be a therapist. You can't be a social worker. You need to kind of get as much education as you can. So like, why don't you go to medical school and be a psychiatrist? So that was what I had been thinking for a while. But then when I started college, all of a sudden I realized like I love studying social sciences. I don't really like studying the hard sciences, I'm not interested in chemistry. So at that point, I kind of decided, okay, if I don't want to go to medical school, then I'll orient myself more toward <laughs> law school. So that was what I had kind of been thinking. And having studied Japanese, I was also thinking about foreign service or pursuing a PhD in Japanese politics and trying to get an academic position later. But it did seem my, my parents are really pushing me toward law and kind of pointing out the downsides of all of these other things for better or for worse. Interesting. I was kind of pre-selected, so I was already kind of oriented toward law. And so working in the office, it kind of felt like, okay, this is confirmation that this is a good direction. I, I like going to an office every day. I like, you know, working with documents, like going to meetings, this kind of professional environment that I've never really experienced before. And neither of my parents has a job like that either. So it was really my first exposure to like business. And I liked it and I found it exciting. So that just felt like, okay, this is what I want to do. It wasn't, as, maybe it was more the idea of an international business related job. Maybe if I'd been at a, a company, I would have had the same experience, but I happened to be at a law firm and already had been thinking about right. preparing to go to law school. Yeah. So you'd received all that information, lots of information from your parents. And then obviously you decide what you want to do yourself, but that experience at that firm, you know, confirmed for you what was, what was lying ahead. And like a lot of people who come here and full warning to any listeners who are thinking of coming here, you either find it culturally a bit tough and never come back. Or like most of us, you, once you taste Japan, you can't get Japan out of your system. And so Mindy, you're definitely the latter type of person because you came back for a couple of 
summers. So take us through that because you did just study and there was also a bank experience tied in there as well. And tell me about that. It's so amazing what you've done. Sure. So I, I loved my first experience working in Japan. So basically, even though I knew at that point that I wanted to go to law school and I also was planning to get a master's degree before law school. So I knew I had many years of schooling ahead of me. So I took the opportunity, every opportunity I could to spend my summers working in Japan. So I ended up coming back for a total of six summers in a row before I actually started practicing as a lawyer. So after the law firm, after that, I was back in the U.S. I guess I had maybe either was going to graduate soon or start my master's. And there's a big career fair called Boston Career Forum that's held in Boston every year. And it's basically kind of a job fair for mostly targeted at Japanese students who are studying in the U.S., either studying abroad or like Japanese Americans who have grown up in both places and happen to be in the U.S. during their college years, but might want to work in Japan. So all of these companies come and you have all of these interviews to find work in Japan. So that was what I did with some friends I studied Japanese with at school. And I ended up getting an internship offer to work at a bank. Ooh, in Japan? Yeah, in Tokyo. So I decided to do that my following summer. And it was an Ended up being, it ended up being an interesting experience because I was hired to work with someone there who was a lawyer because I had said I wanted to go to law school in the trust bank. But it turned out that when I got to Tokyo many months later that summer, the bank had been sanctioned by the FSA and had been totally restructured and like completely changed their business model. And like the internal relations were very different. And so the, the lawyer... I was supposed to work with, I was not able to work with. I still worked in that division, but I think my work was not legal at all. And it was very different. I think I spent a lot of time doing a SWOT analysis of like getting into the student loan business. <laughs> Which it was hard to think positively about after ha having amassed huge student loans myself in the U.S. Good experience, though. Really. Really interesting experience. And it was like a very well-organized internship program. And there were, I can't remember, but maybe like 20 or so students who were Japanese students studying in the U.S. And some Americans who just were interested in Japan or wanted to have a summer experience there. So it was really fun. And we all lived in this Tokyo state together and commuted to work together in the morning. It was very fun and that was a great experience. And you study Japanese then too? I I wasn't I was studying in school at the time but not I ended up studying, I guess, all through college and my master's formally in school. You kept up the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And then you came back to the States then, I think 2007. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I started law school in 2007. And I guess it was the summer before that where I had gone back to the bank. But I also enrolled in a Japanese program at Keio to get in kind of a last bit of study before I started law school. So I was doing, I was working like 30 hours a week and then also going to the language program like four days a week. Right. And you came back to the States. So after that program finished, I'm guessing. And then is that when you started at Stanford? Yeah. Then I moved to Stanford. That was my first time. I think my first time living in a state other than New York, basically. So you went from New York over to California. Yeah, that was a really big change because I'd been in Tokyo by that point for a few summers in a row and having a really great time. <laughs> and then I moved to California and it was really beautiful, but I didn't have a car. I didn't even know how to ride a bike. So it was really hard to get around. And I really missed kind of like being in a big city and Palo Alto is really beautiful, but it is not a big city. So at first I kind of had like, not cultural shock, of course, being American, but I really, really missed that big city life. And I, I wish I hadn't appreciated Stanford more when I was there because it's such a great place. It's a beautiful campus. I've been there, walked around. You actually do need a bicycle to get from one side to the other. <laughs> you definitely do. And you were on the law review there too, right? And did some other volunteering. Yeah, I got really involved in extracurricular activities at Stanford. I did the Journal of Law, Business and Finance. And then my second year, I was the editor, the submissions 
collections editor. So I would review all the articles that got submitted and then kind of select which ones we would actually publish. And then I was also on Law Review. I started Law Review that year as an editor. And then I really liked those activities. So I ended up running for the board of Law Review in my third year. And I was an executive editor. And I spent a lot of time on those activities. I thought law school itself was very tough. It wasn't as fun as college was. And I think U.S. law schools are really geared toward litigators. And I knew at that point already that I wanted to go into corporate law. So it it often felt like my classes were not that relevant to what I was going to do in the future. That I really liked being able to do these other activities where I could work on other skills, like managing people and processes and things like that. Right. Did you, though, dabble a little bit in what might be sort of litigation then? Have some volunteer work. I think you mentioned to me before we got together for this recording today that you had done some other volunteer work as well at Stanford. It wasn't litigation, but I I did pro bono for a few years at a center helping people apply for protective orders against their abusers. So I I didn't want to pursue that as a full-time career, but I really liked that. And before that experience, before law school, I had done a lot of activities from high school school through college about like training on abusive dating relationships in high school and in college I worked at the rape crisis center so I'd always kind of been interested in that area I'd never considered it as a full-time career I'm not sure why but it was kind of an interest that was always really important to me and I always looked for a way to pursue it so I when I found that program it was a pre-established program like you were encouraged to do pro bono and there were different activities that were set up and when I heard about that I thought that was right up my alley and I really enjoyed doing it How did it affect the kind of law you wanted to do or or more so the kind of lawyer that you wanted to be? Oh, that's a great question. But I guess I've never thought about that. But now that you say that, I think it made me, even though I didn't want to pursue that as a career, it definitely made me want to be an empathetic lawyer to be a good listener and kind of help people with their problems because people come and they have these very significant problems and you listen to their heart-wrenching stories and then you kind of help them find solutions of how they can help themselves. And it's very, very different. I won't pretend, but being a corporate lawyer, you do kind of a similar process of your clients come to you with a problem or wanting to get something done and you help them achieve it. So I do like that aspect of the law a lot. It's interesting. I was listening to a podcast the other day and the person there said empathy is a competitive advantage for lawyers. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So I'm glad that that was, it sort of happened to you there that you could try to build that muscle of empathy. And as you say, you have to be a great listener to be a lawyer as well. And so, wow, I could go further into that, but I think we'll carry on. And I I talked about the Venn diagram before, and I really think this next stage of your life is where that middle bit comes in. And I think it was really quite a joyous part of your life for you too. You had your first couple of years, I think, when you may have come again back to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. What happened there? There's some serendipity weaving itself around there and some magic happening in your life as well at that time. I think you know what I'm hinting at. Do you mean meeting my husband or getting a job? Yeah, I did meet my husband in law school. That was that was great. (laughs) Yeah, I met my husband in law school. But before that, I guess uh, knowing I wanted to come back to Japan in the future, I knew I wanted to spend my the summer of my 1L year, my first year of law school working in Tokyo at a law firm if possible and kind of getting a better taste of what that was like to work as a law student rather than a college intern when you can't do very much. So I put a lot of energy into that. I had a huge spreadsheet of every international firm in Tokyo. And wow. Like, yeah, so either the, the managing the hiring partner or a managing partner, or maybe someone who had gone to Stanford who I could find a connection with. And once we were allowed to apply to jobs, I sent out like 40 emails to all of these places looking for jobs. And I I found a job at a great US law firm in Tokyo. So I was able to go back for another summer. Mm, Okay. And so you're in Japan and I think in New York transferring back and forth. Is that right? Mm -hmm, That's right. I spent my 1L summer in Tokyo. And then my next summer, I went back to that firm that I also at that point was thinking of starting my career in New York. So I did spend most of my 
my 2L summer for American students, that's kind of the pivotal summer. You usually do an internship or a summer associate program at the firm where you will get a full-time job offer after graduation. So I spent that at a large New York firm. Yeah. And like you said, by that time, I had already started dating my husband and he was interested in coming to Japan with me in the future, which was really great because I always wondered, like, I want to go, I want to have a career in Japan in the future. But I think if I'm dating someone in America, will that person be willing to just move their whole life to Asia with me? I'm not sure. Especially at the time when people heard I was studying Japanese, I thought I was really like foreign and strange and so far away. So I felt like I, I know what I want to do professionally, but I don't really know how I'll figure out my personal life. Like I'll just, I'll just see. Did he also have a love for Japan or some Japan thread in his life? Or it was really just as he met you, he grew to love Japan, the food, and, and other parts of the culture? Uh, it was it was a bit of both. It was interesting. We met my first day in this Law and Society in Japan seminar at law school. We sat next to each other on the first day. So he had an interest in Japan. And when we talked, it turned out he had studied Japanese for two years himself in college and had been to Japan before. So he wasn't as devoted as I was and had never considered moving there in the future, but he was interested and open. And when I told him about what I wanted to do, he was like, that sounds awesome. Like, let's do that. <laughs> Right. So I think, is this around 2010, 9, 10, around that time? Yeah, 2009, he came with me when I went back to the firm in Tokyo. And then we graduated in 2010. Yeah, that's when this recession, right? I remember being in, in Tokyo at that time and lots of finance lawyers started turning their careers into commercial and corporate lawyers to survive. And so what happened with you in 2010? Because you would have been just about to go into perhaps a law firm and start your career. So what happened then? Yeah, exactly. So my firm deferred me for three months, which is not that long, but at the time it just felt like forever. I've been spending so many years going to so many years of schooling, doing like so many internships to prepare myself for this moment. And now I'm deferred. So I ended up getting lucky again. And somebody who was my friend and colleague at the law firm, the US law firm I'd spent two summers at in Tokyo, he had started his career at that firm and he was a year senior to me and had been deferred from his job for a whole year and ended up spending it at a large law firm in Osaka. And he was about to go back to the U.S. and start his job. And he said, if you want to come to Osaka and work here, I would think of my title was like foreign legal consultant or something. If you want to do that, then they're happy to arrange it. And I said, yes, absolutely. So I got the job at that Osaka law firm and my husband was deferred from his firm for a full year. Year. So he had a lot of flexibility. So he came with me and just hung out while we were there. So it was really fun to go back to Kansai after having studied there and to kind of work in a Japanese firm for the first time, which was really different. Sure. I mean, there's such a lot of serendipity happening for you. And I know ser serendipity, I actually looked it up because it means the occurrence and development of events by chance in a happy and beneficial way. And I don't think you can create serendipity. You have to actually have an involvement or component of chance and opportunity. And it sounds like that's really something that's happened for you, the chance. And you talk about luck, but I think it's chances and opportunities that you've really picked up on. I mean, moving to Osaka is one thing, and I moved there as well. And it was a completely different kettle of fish to Tokyo. What did you like about Osaka? And, and do you speak Osaka dialect? <laughs> Uh, I wish I spoke more having studied in Kyoto, but I was still kind of new to Japanese at that point. So I, and we studied obviously the Hyojungo, the regular, like standardized national Japanese in my school. But I, I know some Kansai Ben and I, I like hearing it. And I learned some phrases like chao chao, things like that. Oh yeah, you're wrong. That's not right. That's not right. Yeah. Yeah, and you you have to do the hand movement when you say it too. <laughs> Correct, right? To say no, 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 chow chow, and and that's exactly right. Oh goodness, it's so much fun. It takes me back. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I mean, I I've lived in Tokyo for many years now, and I really enjoy it. But I do think people in Kansai, especially Osaka, tend to be kind of more open. 
they're fresh and open and direct Mm -hmm. so that was really nice and it was nice it was a really social atmosphere and the attorneys like organized lots of yakiniku dinners and things like that to really get to know people even though I was only there for a few months and to this day I'm still in touch with some of the attorneys there and some of them ended up moving to the Tokyo office as it got larger oh wow I still see them regularly and that that experience really left an impact. There is something about Osaka that makes you sort of forge very deep relationships. When I was there, I worked at Panasonic, but outside of that, I was doing Ikebana flower arranging. And so the ladies that I met during that class, I am still in touch with. And I think it's something about Osaka that uh, familiarity that brings that sort of deep kind of recognition between people. What was the experience that you really loved at the Japanese law firm there? Is there something that stands out for you when you were there? I think probably more than the work experiences, it was the people and all the different social experiences. And I remember we would have like JE lunch, Japanese English lunch, and like a lot of the Bengoshi Japanese lawyers would come and try to speak in English. And we would have like JE poker nights (laughs) once a month. I'm horrible at poker. I can't play, but my husband would actually come with me and we would kind of play together and everyone would sit around the table and just have a beer and have fun and kind of make jokes and it was really fun so what I remember the most is this more than the legal aspect is the social aspect connecting with people they stand out and so I think a little bit after that you did actually get that come back to the U.S. and get that offer and after the deferral but I sense that you maybe have maybe missed Japan and transitioned back here yet again and I I love to hear about that secondment that you had to a Japanese trading house because that's quite an interesting and juicy experience because again perhaps serendipity is working for you but maybe it was was that the right place right time or was it really again connections that you'd built up over those previous years in Tokyo and Osaka I'm curious to hear about this part of your career Mindy yeah that it was actually connections again basically (laughs) I guess my career has been really serendipitous so I I did start my career in New York eventually and my husband and I both like got an apartment and started our jobs and we kind of said, okay, if we love living in New York and we love what we're doing, then we'll just stay here and kind of put Japan out of our heads. But if after a couple of years, we still miss it and we want to go back and we're interested, then like we should just find a way to go and go. So after a few years in New York, I transferred to my law firm's Tokyo office and my husband got a job at a firm in Tokyo and I spent a few years there. And then when I came to the trading house, it was, it was not a secondment actually. I got a job in house. Oh, it was a pure in-house role. Yeah. Pure in-house role. I never went on secondment. But at that point, when my husband was deferred from his law firm for a full year, he ended up getting a job at the New York branch of that trading company. And he was just like helping out on discovery and various matters. And he had kept not even knowing that we were going to move to Japan in the future. But because he had been to Japan both himself and with me and thought we might have a future that related to Japan. And he kept in touch. He had a great experience and he kept in touch with everybody there. And it turned out that some of the people who had rotated through the New York office when he was there were then back in Tokyo and his boss, who was a U.S. lawyer in New York, ended up coming to Tokyo for a five-year stint. And when I was looking for jobs, I interviewed, I wanted to work in-house and I interviewed at a few different places. And I I think it's very, finding an in-house job in Japan has a lot of challenges. And I I really didn't know what to look for, if I should go to like an international company or a Japanese company. But I ended up interviewing at that trading house and uh, like people I had met years ago in New York when my husband worked there were back in Tokyo and his old boss was in Tokyo had been there for maybe like a year or two at that point and I had always gotten along with everybody and I knew that they were really nice and just really fun to work with Um, and they had known me as well so the interview process ended up I had been told by a headhunter like they have a three-stage interview process and you have to do a case study and all of this and I was like oh god (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if I can do that. 
but then I just came for an interview and everyone was so nice and like at the end of an hour-long discussion they said oh you don't have to do any of that other stuff like we're making you an offer (laughs) so that was really great yes it's amazing and I guess too you're right on that point of trying to find the enroll in-house it's not like you can do the spreadsheet of law firms in Tokyo that very much harder to find one but again there you go you you did find one and you you aced the interview so if others are thinking about going in-house would you recommend that as a as a a thing to do along their life or would they you know are they better to continue on their partnership up the ladder to partnership in a firm what what do you think about that I think working in-house is such a great opportunity, whether you want to continue working at a law firm long term, or obviously if you want to switch to an in-house role, then you should just do that at some point. But it's so great to see the client side and what the company is actually thinking along the way. And when you're on the law firm side and you hear about like Ringi, it just, I heard that word a lot, but it didn't mean anything to me. But when you're working in-house, particularly at a Japanese company. And what does Ringi mean for people who may not know what ringi is the official internal approval of a transaction or whatever it is but in order to get that approval you really need a lot of consensus you need consensus building and whoever is managing the deal has to kind of go to all the various corporate departments like legal accounting the business unit involved and kind of get everybody on board with the transaction so that by the time the final ringi documents get circulated everybody like you've done the informational seminar you've answered everybody's questions, addressed their concerns, and made your case throughout the company as to why this is a good thing for the company to do. So by the time the document is circulated, everybody is already on board, and it's just like an official sign-off. It's not the decision has already been made. Perfect definition and description really is of what Ringi is and it's very critical and in-house role. I'm just thinking about that particular um, trading house role that you had and anyone who's been following the weekly videos I put out on LinkedIn each Thursday will have heard my random story. Well, my story about a random discussion where I was in a company and a law firm partner came along and offered me a job having met me and I believe that sort of it almost happened to you or probably did happen happened to you when you move from the trading house to where you are now at Southgate I think it was a little similar to that tell us about that partners I think the partners observed your work and invited you to jump ship I guess that is what happened <laughs> part of my job at the trading company was as one of the few foreign lawyers was like helping manage relationships with the external firms that we used and so in addition to using them for work I also maintained relationships and tried to get to know them and organize presentations and evaluated who the players were to see who would be a good fit to do the work for our company. And I came across my law firm. I had heard of them before. And actually, one of the founders, Mangyo Kinoshita, spoke on that panel with you at Amazon many years ago that I had wanted to attend, but I hadn't. But I, I had heard of Southgate, my current firm, and was really curious about what they did. And I thought, like, it's so small and exclusive, like, I'll never get access to it. But we happened to ask them to pitch for a small matter. That's an area that a venture capital deal that we have expertise in. So I was really excited because we actually asked them to come to the office to pitch And it was my first time meeting them and I was so curious about the firm. So it was great to see them in person and having met a lot of law firm partners as part of my job. I was just really impressed by how kind of nice and honest and humble they were. It was quite a contrast from kind of a lot of the chest beating that I would <laughs> I would hear from other firms about how we're the best at this and you would be crazy to hire anybody else and you know we we've just cornered the market in this area they instead actually said we don't think we're the best firm for this particular transaction but we're happy to introduce you to a firm who we think would be great or we're happy to work with you and be a liaison with that firm and I was just really shocked to hear that and I was like oh I would love to hire this firm and I'd love to hear more about them and then a few weeks later Later, the U.S. partner invited me out to lunch and I thought it was a typical like law firm marketing lunch where he would tell me about the firm and I was looking forward to that because I wanted to hear more. I thought it was so interesting that they'd started this boutique and left big law and we went to lunch and he he was kind of asking about my experience at the company and I was asking about the firm. (laughs) 
And when I had gone to lunch, I was thinking, they're so small. I doubt they're hiring. <laughs> yeah, I doubt they're hiring, but maybe I'll kind of ask about what they're looking to do in the future. And before I broached that at all, he said, we would absolutely love to hire someone like you. And <laughs> I was really shocked. It's almost like the, when they came to pitch to you, you were interviewing them. And then suddenly, without saying it's an interview, going to lunch and going to lunch with a lawyer, you've got to know, could be something like this, is that it ended up being an interview but in a relaxed atmosphere just I think sometimes we do this law firm lawyers and others do this so that we can see how you react and how you behave in an open situation how you interact with the staff and you know the person when you're paying the bill at the end those sorts of things I think is a way of actually interviewing you seeing you from a different perspective so you got that job yeah <laughs> so now what do you do on your daily work so what is it you're at a boutique firm tell me what it is and would you recommend that lawyers look to going into a boutique law firm career path I mean it depends what you want to do but for me it was a very good choice because I had really enjoyed working in house I really enjoyed like in a big firm especially in the U.S. and especially in New York you're really siloed into one narrow practice group so I had started my career in securities and even within securities I was working on like IPOs but also aircraft finance deals and I got pressure as maybe a second or third year the partner said like okay, it's great that you do these different things, but you need to kind of choose one, one of these narrow areas. If you don't want to do aircraft finance, like you should not do so many of those deals. And it's very, very narrow. Mm. And then you come to Japan and you have to be a bit more of a generalist because the offices, a lot of the international offices tend to be smaller here, but you're still like in one specific practice area. And that's what you're affiliated with in the firm. And that kind of determines a lot of the opportunities you have. But being in-house, as you know very well you just do anything that comes across your desk so everything everything <laughs> at first it was really challenging because I I had barely even reviewed just commercial agreements something that wasn't specifically this type of document or this type of document for this type of deal just a general like coal purchase agreement I was like I've never seen this before what what do I do with that so this is a great learning experience it's a learning curve but then you realize it's not your specific legal skills you're there because of your judgment, your judgment in terms of assessing risk, assessing when you might need to involve outside counsel or what kind of what departments need to get involved when you need to raise an issue, when you think something's an issue. So that's really the skill set. And it's so interesting because you do so many different things, especially at a trading house. And I'm sure something like where you worked at Panasonic, when you're working at a company with operations all over the world, there's all these different jurisdictions to deal with. So it's never boring. There's a huge variety of work, a huge variety of jurisdictions, like huge variety of industries, and then also spanning corporate transactions, but even doing some disputes work for the first time. So I really enjoyed that. And I didn't think I could ever get that experience at a law firm, but I kind of still do that working at my firm. We specialize in cross-border M&A and venture capital deals, but because we're small and we're kind of targeting companies who maybe are looking for more cost-effective counsel, so they don't hire the largest firms, more Japanese companies that may need assistance. They've never done a transaction involving English before, but they need English assistance and they're not, they can't just go to their usual Komon Bengoshi, the Japanese firm they have on retainer. Mm. And we also work with foreign companies who are entering Japan for the first time, or maybe who have a small Japanese office, but unfortunately during COVID, a couple of, we got a couple of engagements for clients who were closing their Japan office and or people dealing with employment issues. So I've been able to kind of keep doing a huge variety of practice areas that I've been doing at the company. So I think for anybody who's interested in kind of having the opportunity to do many different things, but not be in-house, it's a really good opportunity because you just do whatever comes your way. Sure. And you've also managed to, I think if we go back to that Venn diagram I keep talking about, you still got your study or your university side of things because you teach a class for LLM students, right? Back at KO again. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that and how you're managing that working life, two kinds of your working life, right? Your study side, the university side and where you are at Southgate. Yeah, that also came about through serendipity, I guess. There we go. 
I co-teach the class with someone else who was on that panel with you in 2018, Reed Monroe Sheridan. Oh, Reed, yes. Yeah, Reed co-teaches a different class with Eric Marks, the U.S. partner at my firm Southgate, and he was looking for someone to co-teach another class, and so he had gotten in touch with Eric and asked if I would be interested. That was how that came about. I love how this is happening. Yeah. <laughs> this is why, though, Mindy, I'm traversing your career and how you can literally see it as golden weaving all the way through the things that you've done and how important it is to seize these opportunities that you've had and to also keep your connections up with people and how your university is coming back through again into your work. And it really is rather amazing how you've done this. Yeah, and I actually, I think Reed said that he thought of me for that particular class. It's a class on legal writing and research because of my experience at Law Review when I was in law school, because a lot of the students in our class are writing, they're LLM students, and they're writing their final papers, and some of them might try to publish them. So I, I have experience having kind of like reviewed articles that are being submitted for publication and kind of what we look for. <laughs> right, who would know that it would go back to stand? Stanford days that something would happen. I, I didn't. <laughs> I really hope that people who are listening do pick up on all of this because it's just so important. All of those pinpoints along your path have all been connected up, right? The dots are connecting. And so you're such a busy, you're such a busy person. You've got such a busy life. So I want to pop into your routine and how you keep yourself lined up for the day. And so I'd love to know what you do first thing in the morning to get yourself on the right foot. First thing in the morning, I kind of check my phone, try not to send too much stuff on work email. I really like to read, there's a feature on LinkedIn where they kind of post some of the biggest articles from Asia. And I've been reading a lot of articles about work-life balance and how people cope with the pandemic and burnout. I'm really interested in like work environment issues. So I like to read about that and see what's going on. And then unless I have an early meeting, I always try to make time to exercise in the morning. I go for a run and listen to music or I go to like a, a cardio boxing class. <laughs> So, and I, I love getting outside to do that too. So I try to do that almost every morning. You're working at home, right? Mm -hmm. What's your favorite thing about your home workspace? And when do you turn off that laptop at the end of the day? What don't I love about my home workspace? Oh, good. Tell us. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love, I work at my dining table. So I have a huge space right in front of the kitchen. I love being home with my dog, mm. spending time with him and taking him for a walk to get out of the house during the day. I love my husband is also working from home most of the time. So we used to sometimes hardly see each other before the pandemic. If, if I like was working late, especially when I was more junior, sometimes I would just come home and we'd have half an hour to hang out before we had to go to bed. But now we work in different places in the house, but we are home and we can eat lunch together almost every day. We have dinner together every day. So I love that. Love being able to kind of do chores during the day. It's a silver lining, isn't it? To be able to have that time together. Mm -hmm. And so working at home and even beyond that, I guess if we were out at that place in Ebisu and, and we were having something to drink, we would be getting quite philosophical by now. <laughs> so I'm interested to know about things that are within you. So traits that you're really proud of. And I'd also really love to hear what success means to you. So tell me something about yourself that keeps you on the straight and narrow, one of your traits, and then let me know what you think about success. I guess, I guess one of my traits or something that I am trying to work on is like, again, with the theme of being a good listener, I, I've always loved supporting my coworkers and like loved kind of hearing their issues and helping empathetic listening and problem solving, like helping them figure out what to do about them. When I've been in a role where I could be a mentor in the workplace and help people with their problems and sometimes model how you can be a lawyer and do these other things or how you can be an effective lawyer, but without being abrasive or be having some of these traits. Like when I was working in New York, the male partners had, <laughs> I always said how I need to find my own voice and how do I do that? 
So I guess for traits, just trying to be really supportive of the people around me, especially women and kind of coaching them when I can, to the extent I can. It's almost a little bit like that therapy they mentioned at the beginning coming through there and looking after people and and making sure that they're okay, right? Having a time to look after others. Yeah, yeah, I love this. I love when people come to me with problems and I love trying to help them solve them. Do you have a word of the year or a theme or some kind of mantra that you have within you that that guides you? I do. This year, my word is a bit boring. (laughs) My word this year is focus. Focus. It could be great. It's kind of more narrow in that. A lot of times when I'm working from home, I just get really distracted. I don't think that's boring. I think focus is what we need during this pandemic time. I think it's a great choice. I just can sometimes kind of go into a rabbit hole looking into something and I kind of lose track of what I'm doing. So I try to remind myself, like, focus, focus on the task at hand, like, don't get too distracted. But I think you can apply it in a larger sense as well. And it can be interrelated to your word, Catherine, intentionality of like, focus is this am I actually focusing on what I'm supposed to be doing or have I gotten myself distracted ah right I see okay I think it's a good word and so I mean focus can be focusing on the right thing and and probably not too much focus as well and same with being intentional I'm not sure that too much intentionality is a good thing but it's it's in moderation isn't it whatever we choose moderation But that leads me to, I would really love to know the wisest thing anyone has ever said to you and who said it. Perhaps it was your dad, but it it may well be somebody else. I don't know if I have any, I don't have any great quotes. I mean, my dad definitely saying like, you can't just speak English, kind of, you can't just know about one thing. You have to learn about other people. That was obviously, that has shaped a big part of my personal and professional life. Yeah, sure. Maybe that advice, that kind of like curiosity. Yes. Keeping curious. Yeah. How about the other side then? Something that's been said to you that probably wasn't the best advice that you received and may have helped you to actually take a different track. Is there anything that comes to mind there? Maybe I've heard a few law firm partners say things like, you'll sleep when you're dead. It's a joke, but, and you you kind of chuckle, but like the older I get and more senior I get, the more I like really disagree with that kind of philosophy of go, go, go all the time, like prioritize all of these things above your own free time and your own health. I think the older I get, the more I realize I have prioritized work above anything else for a long time and that I don't want to keep doing that and I don't think it's healthy Uh, if if that's what makes you happy then it's fine but that's not what I want to do and I think that's probably not right for a lot of people and it's very easy to feel like oh all these people around me are working so hard everyone's like "I, I can't I can't take a day off I can't do this because everyone's just so busy all the time and it's helpful to kind of take a step back and think that's not what we have to be doing. And actually, if we don't take a step back, I think with connectivity, like the world at work can just be faster and faster. You can get things done faster. People are always available. And is that really what we should be doing? Or is it okay to say, just because I I can be reached doesn't mean I should be. (laughs) It's okay to have boundaries between your personal and professional life. Or even if you can't have a hard boundary, it's okay to kind of say, to try to set some boundaries and try to say I'm not just available at all of these times. Would that be your advice then for young lawyers and young students coming up the ranks or is there something else that you'd like to give to them as your advice? I mean, I think probably most people will be pretty busy when they're junior lawyers. I was, I worked very hard and I think it's okay to some extent when you're just establishing yourself and you have so much to learn. It's really good to kind of take advantage of all the opportunities and learn as much as you can and like put your hand up for for deals and be on different deals, work with different clients, maybe work with different teams if you have the opportunity. I think it's okay to make yourself busy when you have the capacity to do it, but maybe think of your life beyond that. And in terms of other advice to young lawyers, I guess I would say, I think I've often been worried, what will people think of me? What will they think of me if I switch jobs? What will they think of me if I, you know, do this? And it just doesn't matter at all. 
what matters is what makes you happy and what's best for you. And who, like, who are these people we think of anyway? Most people have no idea what you're going through or what you're thinking and making these decisions. And most people, if they see you've made one decision versus another, they're not actually going to judge you. They'll think, oh, you, you chose that job because it was a great opportunity. Like, that sounds great. So just don't be self-conscious and self-doubting. Like, if something sounds good to you, then pursue it. Or if you know something isn't working for you, it's okay to change to change and do something else or explore another area. Oh, I love that because it's just so true. And we sometimes are just thinking about this inside of us and it's not real. It's just an idea that we've got that we we feel that what will people think? What will they think? What will they think? And actually it's really just inside of us. I, I really love that advice. And I think too, you know, lawyers of the future, what do you think they should be focusing on? And perhaps law firms, you've talked about well-being and doing what you wish. Is that what you'd like to say is your prediction or your desire for law firms of the future? And for you yourself in the future, how do you want to even dig down deeper and become that kind of person in the future? Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, a lot of law firms with the pandemic are kind of talking a lot more about well-being. And I think that's a great first step, but they may not necessarily be following through on that because it, it can be hard to prioritize yourself if you still have to build 2000 hours a, a year or whatever the requirements are. So I think I do hope that more people kind of step away from the so-called hustle porn and kind of pride themselves on being busy and climbing the ladder and kind of think more carefully and intentionally about what it is they really want to do or is it possible to kind of have a fulfilling career but also not work 14 hours a day or not be available all the time and to, to have that be okay to have that be that path be just as interesting and prestigious as staying at a large firm and making partner and working all the time. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with being a partner and working no. long hours, but mm -hmm. really just being happy within. Yeah. I think is the most important thing. Yeah. Wow. Is there anything we haven't covered today that you wanted to mention, Mindy, or anything um, you did talk about that you want to re-emphasize? I can't think of anything in particular. Okay. Well, if that's the case, <laughs> I'm going to finish up now with the final super six, the quick fire round of six questions I ask okay. every guest when I finish up the interview. And so the first one is if I was to give you a million yen in cash, where in Japan would you spend it? Your favorite store or destination, or maybe it's both? Hmm. I mean, I would love to travel, but since I can't do that right now, I guess that would be a perfect amount to buy a new sofa. And I've been wanting to buy one for years. So I would maybe go to Bow Concept or Actus and finally buy a new sofa because the buttons are popping off on mine and it's very annoying. Love it. Yes, that sounds like a great idea. And can you share a podcast you've been listening to or a book that you've read that you recommend? Yes. I I guess two podcasts come to mind. One is I really love listening to uh, its full release with Samantha B. She's like a political comedian in the US and she has a show called Full Frontal on TV. And my old coworker's husband actually co-produces her podcast. And so I started listening maybe last year when it came out oh, wow. because of that. But I just really enjoy it. She's so funny and she has a lot of, she usually does an in-depth interview with someone kind of like you and a lot of times talks about the political environment. And so especially living abroad and feeling so removed from everything that's going on in the U.S., it's nice to kind of hear like a comedic take on everything that's going on. So I like that. And I also, <laughs> this is my nerdy podcast recommendation. I like a website called Law Insider that like publishes provisions uh, aggregates provisions from publicly filed contracts that are filed with Edgar, the SEC service in the US. And they have a podcast called Contract Teardown, and they'll go through like a different public contract every week with an expert and go through the different provisions and talk about what they would change if they were rewriting it, what, what they would push back on if they were negotiating it. And it's kind of, <laughs> my husband makes fun of me when he hears me listening to it at home. Home when I'm not working but it's good though we need the, the softer fun side and also we always need to be learning so I love that yeah exactly I'm going to put them on my subscribe list this week thank you for that 
Yeah, it's great, especially working in house when you're when you navigate so much yourself. Unlike a law firm, you don't have like a real training. You just figure out how to do things. It's great to kind of hear how other lawyers would approach this contract and think like, uh, okay, I would have pushed back on that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. And so, if you were stuck on a desert island and needed to bring one person one item and one food, what and who are they? I would definitely bring my husband as a person. I would bring chocolate as my food. I love chocolate and I eat it all the time. I guess as my item, I would bring a computer because you can get information, listen to music, watch shows, do a workout video. Because it is a desert island after all. Yeah, I guess that would make the most sense. Lovely. And is there a Famous person or celebrity you would love to meet? Maybe it's Samantha B, but is there somebody <laughs> you have already met perhaps too? I love cooking and baking. I spend, that's one of my big hobbies. And I've been following a website, a cooking blog called Smitten Kitchen since I started baking in 2009. So I would love to meet the founder, Deb Perlman, who lives in New York. She's just been like such a comforting voice. I, I still follow her blog and make her recipes regularly. So it would be really fun to meet her. Oh, that's so wonderful. And going over the other side of the house to the bedside cabinet, what's on top of that? bedside cabinet for you right now tissues for treasure vaseline <laughs> let's see the the books i'm reading slowly i'm reading a book called life after law that talks about kind of former lawyers who have gone off and done other things and that's really interesting and then i'm also i like to read cookbooks cover to cover actually they often have really interesting stories and i'm reading a cookbook called the pastry chef's guide Oh, gosh, you've got me hungry. I really want to <laughs> see them. So thank you for that. And also just a bonus question about something about Mindy that others don't know about you. I mean, I think people who know me know both that I love dogs and I love baking. I often bring what I bake into the office back in the days when we would go to the office. Maybe people wouldn't know that I used to be captain of the fencing team in high school. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. Well, that is really lovely. And I really want to thank you so much for sharing your story. We went into really quite a deep sort of dive into your career and I loved your tips and nuggets of advice. And it was really great to connect with you in this way. I'm glad I captured you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine, for having me. This was really fun. I hope one day someone is able to interview you so we can finally find out all about your interesting career path. That's a very interesting idea. We'll have to ask <laughs> Jane, Jane, my podcast manager, to get on to that. Yeah. Great idea. How can any of the Legal Eagles listening here connect with you? Can we do that on LinkedIn or other social like Instagram or email? How can we do that? Yep. I, I'm an active LinkedIn user. So I'm Mindy Allen on LinkedIn. So I'm happy for anyone to send me a message. Fantastic. Good. We'll put that in the show notes. So anyone who's interested in connecting and learning more from you can just reach out to you on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Okay, well, I'm going to finish up here. We've had a fantastic conversation about so many different things. And I'm so grateful for you for coming on and being my sixth guest. And now we're over halfway through season one of Lawyer on Air, aiming to get 10 legal eagle lawyers for this first season. So I want to thank you again for your honesty, especially for someone in the legal profession who's shown all of us that you can do a lot in your legal career and experience many, many things and be open to any opportunity and serendipity that comes along your way. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. And for my listeners, please do like this episode, subscribe to Lawyer On Air, and also do drop us a short review because that helps Lawyer On Air be seen and heard by more people. And actually, you can now go onto my website and find this episode and leave me a voicemail. It's a new technology. I'd love to see you go and do that and hear your actual voice. So do go ahead and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy listening to it and be inspired to live a wonderful lawyer lady life. Thank you so much, Mindy. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you for having me. That's all now for everybody. Thank you very much. See you on the next episode. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer On Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. It's my passion to share my stories of amazing legal ladies. 
So please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I would love to connect with you, so jump on over to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Insta, where you can find me. The links are in the show notes below. Well, that's all from me today, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer on Air. Cheers, kampai, and bye for now.